Welcome to Gurgle, a bite-sized podcast from the creators of Ad Nauseam. Looking to whet your appetite for the classics? Gurgle will tickle your taste buds and leave you wanting more. And now, from the Vomitorium, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. All right, hey, we're gurgling. Yes, yes, I'm. We're back. I think. Are we back in the gurgle mode now? Uh, temporarily. Temporarily. Okay. Right, but we got to keep this tight and to the that's point. Right, remember? That's right. I want to get uh, out the, the announcer said it was bite sized. Okay. All right. So we're talking about the the uh, palladium. The palladium. Yes. That's correct. So the palladium. I was reading. This came up in a in a book I was reading about mm-hmm. uh, kind of the like the history of late antiquity, and it was. Uh, it's always kind of fascinating to me. I love I love stories where. There's like an object that's prevalent in mythology, and Correct. then it kind of makes a transition to kind of a real world object, yes. possibly. Mm-hmm. And so I love things that kind of bridge that. And so this falls in that category: the crystal skull, yes, the Easter Island effigies, yes, so exactly. on and so forth. Exactly right. So the pal- the Palladium, yes, um, for our listeners who might not be familiar, is refers to this wooden statue of Athena that uh, is in the Citadel of Troy. Yes, and Odysseus and Diomedes stole it from yes. the Citadel during their midnight raid. Exactly right. There was this. There was a. Um, not prophecy isn't the right word, but there was an oracle that said that uh, Troy would uh, not fall as long as it had the Palladium in their citadel. Right. Right. This was the totem. The totem. Right. So, um, and so the scholars and, and others that have written about this kind of have, have speculated that what was this? It was a, a kind of an anthropomorphic statue of right. Athena. Uh, most think of it was more just kind of a crude. Uh, wooden effigy, mm-hmm. um, and and there's you see you see lots of this these kinds of things around the world like like, uh, like a found object or like a, a meteorite or some sort right. of, or some sort of stone mm-hmm. is consecrated and considered to be sacred, mm-hmm. um, and then it maybe gets it finds its place into a kind of a, into a sacred space in a temple, right? But over time, it becomes anthropomorphized into something uh, more kind of concretely humanoid. Yes, and it can even be sculpted and worked in that fashion so that it looks like such. Exactly. So the Greek word is a toxoanon. Yes. Right? Toxoanon, an effigy, crude carving, something found in nature, fallen from heaven. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've seen one, uh, something like this at Delphi, the Omphalos. The Omphalos, right? yeah, right, right. Uh, supposedly fallen from heaven, and then it has on it pomegranates and other carved sorts of surface features. Right. The, I guess uh, to make it look more appealing. I guess so, yeah. There's, you remember on the, the, the one they keep outside at Delphi is that is just a plain one. Right. And it looks like an acorn, I kind of pointed Very out. Very much. Yeah, uh, the belly button of the world. That's correct. Right. So in the place where I grew up, Mm -hmm. we're going to keep it tight and focused today, but in the place where I grew up, behind where I lived, there was a legend. I've never told you this. You'd like this. It has a certain flavor of liminality. I'm already interested, yeah. yeah. There was a legend that an iron ore meteorite had fallen back there. Really? Yes, a large lump of iron. Did you go looking for it? Uh, No, because I didn't hear the legend until I was much older, and the place where it would probably have been had been buried. There had been what's called a, um, a fence row. You know, the, the agricultural land used to be divided up into lots of rows because the plots were small. Yeah. And that's where you would dump all the stones and the stumps and so forth. Eventually, these things were buried so you could have lots of contiguous agricultural land. Ah, okay. And when this was buried, the meteorite went down in, apparently. So it's, it might still be It down, might still be there, but there. maybe too deep to be reached with a you know metal detector. Gotcha. But that's a tuxoanon, Exactly. Right? That's the kind of thing. Right, right. right. So um, others have compared this, this the, what the Palladium might have been. Or how we're supposed to imagine it with the um, the statue of Athena Polias right. in the Erechtheion up on the uh, up on the Acropolis. That's right. right. So uh, Athena was first worshipped there before she gets there her the big place in the Parthenon, just right next just, door. Right next door, a little bit to the south. Mm-hmm. And so um, some have thought that that was also just kind of a crude wooden effigy. Um, uh, Tertullian is on is on record mm-hmm. and describing it though. I mean, a Tertullian, North African, right? That's correct. Right. Uh, is there any record of him traveling to Athens? Or no, but it? Um, uh, he was a well-known lawyer. Some of his work survives in the Justinian Pandex, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And his father was a well-known Roman. So either he or his father may have traveled, or it's just part of the lore. Right. So the, he makes a reference to this statue in his Apologeticus, um, where he describes it as just kind of a crude effigy without really w- without kind of a shape or form. Right. So. Uh, section 16, the notes here say, yep. right? Yeah, that's right. We'll read a little bit of Latin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please read it for us. Pala satica, quae sine effigie rudi palo et informi ligno prostat. So what, what, well, how would you render that? So yeah. Palace, um, yeah, Athenian palace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she stands there, right? Uh, which, or which stands there, sine effigie rudi, uh, without any, you know, rough appearance, um, in a what a simple and wooden shapeless form shapeless form mm-hmm. right so um, a formless shape something like that yeah 
So, I mean, I find that really interesting. It, it, it always makes me wonder, okay, you know, did Tertullian go to, to Athens? And if he right. could go there, could anybody kind of peek in on the statue? Right. So, but um, maybe he's just simply reporting the tradition about it. One yeah. of the things that I think it points out is that even in antiquity, there was the concept of antiquity. Right. So they thought of themselves as advanced, as every generation does. Yeah. They looked back at our ancestors who worshipped this, you know, unshaped a wooden thing. We we worship things that you know have been worked by Polycletes, and yes, Praxiteles, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this this um, this palladium is a is a talisman of protection, mm-hmm. and um, whoever has the palladium will uh, the, your city will never fall will never fall. So um, some stories associated with this is that um, the palladium could fell from heaven right. in responding to a, a prayer of uh, of Elis, a Trojan um, priest. Right. Um, from which we get, you know, Elium, so a, right. a founder of, of, of Troy. Yeah, one of the founding fathers, you might say. Right. And so it's almost like the city kind of grows up around the Palladium. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then later in kind of the Trojan War legends, um, uh, Helenus, a Trojan priest, captured by Odysseus outside the walls of Troy. And uh, he's the one who's they kind of wear him down. You know, they sit him down with the you know, the single light bulb yes. hanging above, it, and they grill him. Good or cop, bad cop. Delilah with Samson. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just but, kind of finally wears him down. He finally gives up the secret. Right. And so he gives up the secret and says, "Yes, if you take the Palladium, then Troy will will fall." Hmm. Um, and the this the 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 story that we know of it survives from this um, the so called Little Iliad. You know, okay. one, one of these pieces of the larger Trojan saga. How many L's a, in that one? Uh, in little in that little Iliad, still yeah. just one. Yes, right, right, exactly. <laughs> but two in the previous word. Maybe that's where the bleed over has come from. So this is part of the epic cycle. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It exists as fragments. Then. It, exactly right. Okay, but part of that cycle that you, if you stitch it all together, you can mm-hmm. more or less tell the whole story. So uh, in that, Odysseus disguises himself as a beggar, um, and it's Helen who who tells him where exactly he needs to go. Treasonous once again. Right. Yeah. Hmm. So I mean, Helen plays that complicated role right. of uh, you know whose side is she really on? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The pharmacon, right? The drugs that she's mixing. She's mixing. Odyssey book four. We got to send the reader, the listener, excuse me, back to the Odyssey series. Exactly. Go back there, check it out, book four. Right. And there's also there's that story where she's imitating the the wives yes. the, the voice of the wives of the men in the in the, in the horse to drive them crazy that's correct right. so to try to get them to come out right so she's uh, she's um she's uh, betraying the greeks on one hand she's helping the greeks on the other hand right. mysterious mysterious yep so odysseus and diomedes in their nighttime raid Yes. Not unlike the nighttime raid of Nisus and Euryalus in uh, Aeneid Book 9. Yes, exactly. Which we're going to get to. Yep. They sneak into that citadel and uh, they steal the statue. Yep. And um, that's kind of the, the first domino that uh, mm-hmm. to, to fall there. It's a favorite. For, um, for the destruction of the city, you're saying. That's what I'm saying. That, that's the, f- the catalyst. Yes. Yep. And so it was, a, it was, I was just doing some kind of clicking around in like Google images. This, this was a favorite scene of, of vase painters where it's usually Diomedes who's carrying it. Mm. And then um, uh, uh, Odysseus is, is right, running alongside. Okay. Why, yeah. why is that? I, I don't know. <clears throat> is, I mean, Diomedes said to, it, usually the statue in these paintings is, is fairly formidable. It's very anthropomorphic. Right. He's, ho- he's holding it up above his head. It's got to be anthropomorphized. Otherwise, nobody would know what right, it exactly. is. So he's carrying, what's he running with his log? Right. For, right? <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe Diomedes, the, he's physically stronger than it yeah. is. But um, I, I have no idea. Hmm. But that's where kind of the story starts to shift into something okay. kind of mythical, uh, quasi-historical, into something maybe uh, possibly you know, actually historical. Yeah, so Jeff, since you're helming this particular episode of mm-hmm. Gurgle, mm-hmm. Um, was there an actual Palladium? I think there was. Really? Or at least something that was later that was maybe later made and then claimed to be. So this is um, history's mysteries. Right, okay. I- I- exactly. So th- there were traditions that say, okay, what happened after Diomedes stole it, right? Did he bring it back to his tent? Mm-hmm. Did, did he, uh, you know, set it up on his mantle and back home? Right. Um, so bust the myth, myth for us. Do, do some myth busting. Well, What's I mean, going on? some traditions say that it made its way to Athens. Okay. Um, that it's made its way to Argos, which is make, uh, make some sense. I mean, there are traditions that, um, let's say in Aeschylus' is Agamemnon, he's the king of Argos, not, Correct. not Mycenae. Mm-hmm. Um, so it winds up in the power center. Others say it winds up in Sparta. Um, I mean, this could be used to kind of explain, like, you know, who's who's on the winning or the losing side of oh, that, I see. that conflict, right? Um, and then, of course, as the power shifts, you know, further west, uh, the tradition says that the Palladium finally made its way to Rome. Yeah. Um, and here, I think this is where I would say, okay, this enters into something um, fairly secure uh, in terms of historicity. Okay. And so um, 
in the Temple of Vesta, downtown Rome, you've seen it, right? Of this, course, that, sure. That, that kind of circular temple down that's there. That's right. Um, the sources say that the Romans kept there. That's where they kept the, you know, the, the, the eternal flame going. Yep. But they also kept the Palladium there as, as a way of kind of securing the protection of Rome for eternity. Mm. And um, it's there is a story of that there was a fire at the temple um, in uh, 214 B.C. Okay. And it kept the, the the temple of Vesta catches on fire, and a, one uh, Lucius Caecilius Metellus mm-hmm. is blinded as he rushes into the temple to rescue the Palladium. Huh. So, and that I mean, th- an act of self sacrifice and heroism. Right. We've got to save the Palladium, or Rome herself falls. Right. And so, I mean, th- the aspects of it that you know, he's blinded in doing this. I mean, it, I guess it could have happened. This it, is the same individual who captured um, Hannibal's elephants. Is it the same guy? Yeah, same general. Okay. A very okay. famous family, the Metelli. Okay. All right, so um, I should tell you about it sometime. Oh man, wow, we got to keep this short. All right, right, sorry. Right, so he he one bad puns, okay? Right, so well, there might be some kind of mythic padding to the to the story. Okay, um, that does seem it seems to rest upon the fact that that the assumption is, oh yeah, there was an object and it was rescued from the fire. Okay, so whether this had anything to do with an actual object at Troy. I would probably say probably not. Okay. But by this time, you know, this, an object had been created, fashioned to kind of link um, history, to link Roman accomplishment, to, to link Roman ambition with this, you know, this, this this Greek mythic tradition that they so much wanted to be a part of. Taking on a life of its own. Yep. Okay. So then later on... Um, in, we got to fast forward, right? We got to fast forward. Yeah. So in the third century, later in the third century, um, uh, Elagabalus... My, one of my favorite emperors. I yes. Know, right? What a so, name. Oh, so this is, uh, what, 280s, 270s? Yes. Was yeah. it earlier? I'm not exactly sure. But we're in the 3rd century AD. Right. right? A- after uh, the Severan dynasty, after Septimius Severus. I think it's in the early, the, the first half. The first half. I think that's right. So okay. a good, you know, nearly 500 years after that fire. Right. right? And so apparently he moves the Palladium and other sacred Roman objects to the Elicabalium. Is there any mention of what these other um, objects are? I don't know. Is there like a... a coaster with felt on the bottom that would keep the palladium in place so it wouldn't get bumped you know, as you walk nice. by yeah exactly like a things you find on the bottom of like your your golf trophy correct right right it wouldn't scratch the table of your you know the, the surface of your marble table i'm sure that's that was part of it okay here. Right. so you say he took it to the elegabalium right so <laughs> that's what i think is his rumpus room or something like that <laughs> Can you um, imagine how he he would explain that to his wife? It, it, what are you building? Oh, it's, it's an elegabalium. Oh, right, right. That's Every like, emperor has one. Why shouldn't I? Exactly. I told you about this, honey. That's right. Just right. go down the stairs. There's the big screen TV. Right. So apparently this is a temple that he humbly dedicated to himself. Okay. Um, just up and above the forum in the um, the northeast corner of the Palatine Hill. So the Palatine Hill is where one can you know climb up after you go through the Arch of Titus. Yep. You go off to the left there, and you walk up, and then you can the Aventine's not too far away. Yep. With the House of Livia. And then you can look down into the forum from yes. that, that great vantage point. It's almost a precipice, right? It is. Yep. It's great. And then and on the other side you can look down into the Circus Maximus, right? Right. But you're walking in the into the in the through the Tony neighborhood neighborhood of the of ancient Rome. The right? Beverly Hills, yep. right? The Heritage Hill District where you live here in Grand Rapids. Well, okay. It depends, All right. it depends on what section you're in, but um, Moving along. Right. So um he moves it there. Okay. And the next time it shows up is um about a century later, Constantine, oh. uh, he takes the Palladium and he makes a, a, a show of moving it from Rome to Constantinople, hmm. which I think you could take as a... as a He's repatriating He's it. repatriating it, yep. Yeah. And he's basically saying, Rome's the past, Constantinople, Constantinople is where the future lies. It's like taking the Elgin marbles back to Greece. Yes. It's a similar idea. Yes, very good. So Constantine is now kind of a hero, yep. right? Yep, yep. So he apparently takes it there and he buries it under the co- the column of Constantine, mm-hmm. and this this monument to conveniently himself, named right in this kind of this oval shaped forum there, and that column is still there. Hmm. He didn't want a Constantinabalium. <laughs> Too much of a mouthful, I suppose. <laughs> right, his own rumpus room. <laughs> so he apparently buries it there, and that's more or less where it disappears okay. from history. Hmm. So um, there has been. Uh, so as I was reading about this, you know, one of the I questioned, like, has anybody looked for this? And of right. course, people have looked for it. Right. And so, it but was, has anyone found it? Nobody has found it. Okay. Right. So apparently, in a let me just check the. Uh, um, well, the report is from 1955, but there was a um, some archaeological explorations uh, near and under the column in the middle part of uh, of the, the previous century, right. which was looking for the Palladium and other objects, again, that probably Constantine took from the Elegabalium. Right. And uh, nothing the was... Felt, the felt covered uh, cozy for the right. Palladium. Right. Nothing was found. Mm. But, I mean, 
could it then explain why, you know, by some um, calculations, Const Constantinople uh, survived in Roman hands until 1453? For a very long time. Very long time, right. right. And did the Turks take that palladium? Is it somewhere in... Uh, um, I don't know. But, I mean, that was the Turkish capital, so they would have kept it there. That's true. Right? right, exactly. They would have kept it there. I mean, and it still stands in another form. It's a very old city. But right. who knows? So that's maybe where the Palladium is. Maybe where the Palladium is. Um, Though, if really made of wood, it's got to be destroyed by now. Long, long destroyed, mm -hmm. right. But um, I think that, you know, between kind of the Elagabalus and the, 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 the Metelli, one of the Metelli, right. and what Constantine's actions, we are talking about there was some actual object. Okay. Yeah. And uh, probably put on display and that move from Rome to, to Constantinople as a way of kind of, you know, assuring the people that, yeah, this is a, this is a, a serious, legitimate, and final move. Fascinating. Well, that's a gurgle, Jeff. We have to wrap it up. We do. Yeah. So um, we need to mention a couple of things before we go. That's correct. Uh, tell us uh, quickly about the Moss Method, Dave. Yeah. So you can study Greek online, mossmethod.com. Check out my program, Takes You from Neophyte to Erudite. Yes. We want to say thank you to Hackett Publishing, who sponsors uh, all of our activities, hackettpublishing.com. And also Ratio Coffee, which you can uh, find at ratiocoffee.com. Yeah. Listen to some other episodes to get the coupon code. Yes. And uh, tell us also about LLPSI. That's correct. If you want to study Orberg's Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata with me, Go to latinperdm.com slash LLPSI and check out this high-value expert program. We need to say thank you yes. to Mishka Fernando for putting together all of our uh, mixing and sound mm -hmm. so wonderfully. We've got to thank Ken Tamplin for the uh, intro and outro music, that ripping guitar. Yes, and uh, also to our, our wonderful announcer. We, who, oh, yeah. Let's, let's give him a Brian, little Brian. Thanks, Brian, for yeah. giving us the wonderful voiceover. That's, uh, that's a wrap on this gurgle. Thanks for listening.